My name is Dr. Tia Jackson Bay. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. I'm currently an assistant professor in uh, the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. Well, the Black fertility myth is something that um, I discuss um, among colleagues and in various presentations really to describe the uh, idea that Black women do not have infertility and instead have really high fertility. You know, unfortunately, this comes from lots of different misconceptions, historically, stereotypes over time um, that don't really serve the Black women who are facing infertility today. And so it's something that really presents itself as a barrier to fertility treatment um, based on both how Black women view themselves and how other people, including healthcare providers, view this population. Well, in my arena of reproductive medicine, we look at a lot of different things that contribute to increased or decreased fertility, um, as well as things that could impact your fertility. And so disparities just mean that different groups of people have the different outcomes for the same condition. And so with fertility or infertility being one of those, one of the most common that we see is that some persons present to fertility care later, um, either at older ages or with longer stages of infertility at the time that they seek treatment. Uh, in addition, some persons may also have different outcomes even if they receive the same treatment, they may have uh, better success rates or worse success rates, depending on what group you belong to. And so those are some of the significant uh, disparities that we see in reproductive medicine. In addition, there are disparities in who are reproductive medicine providers. Um, while we still don't have complete numbers, we know that persons of color and even women remain underrepresented amongst providers of reproductive medicine. So all of these are things that we're looking to actively work on um, because we know that by increasing diversity in the, work for, in the workforce, as well as addressing disparities in terms of access and healthcare outcomes, we create a better system for everyone. Healthcare disparities contribute to unequal health care because there can be essentially uh, two different levels of care. If everyone does not have the same access to treatments that are known to be uh, effective, safe, um, and can adequately address the issue, then that means that you know, one group of persons will reap the benefits of those treatments while some people can't even be seen to evaluate if they're candidates for those treatments. And so that really you know, uh, amounts to an issue in terms of justice, in terms of who has access to necessary treatments. We talk about this in all different aspects of medicine and therefore reproductive medicine is no different. You know, the outcomes here may not amount to matters of life and death, the way that it is with maternal mortality per se, but still there can be huge injustices in terms of who is able to have the tools necessary to build their families. And so that's something that we talk about often. So there's a lot of different reasons um, that contribute to the increased rate of maternal mortality amongst Black women, but one of the most pervasive is actually racism. Um, even when we control for factors like um, economics, finances, income, insurance status, and even income of the person, we find that Black race alone is a predictor in terms of increasing poor outcomes for mothers in the perinatal period. And so what that means is there may be a link between how these persons are perceived and how they're treated during their pregnancy and even for the year thereafter that negatively affects their outcomes. So, you know, some of the things that we're looking into are treatment algorithms um, to make sure that, you know, all, uh, all patients are being treated equally. We also want to make sure that Black mothers are being heard. Um, and so when they have complaints of pain, discomfort, some things that are concerning for worsening disease, that their um, complaints are not being ignored. 
Also, we want to make sure that Black mothers are feeling comfortable so that they feel um, comfortable disclosing issues to their providers, that they're comfortable coming into health centers um, and seeking the care that they need. So we discussed a few different kinds of barriers to care. Um, one is just perception or patient knowledge of the issue. Uh, for instance, in reproductive medicine, sometimes patients don't know when um, is the appropriate time to seek care for their issue. And so that, can, that lack of knowledge, that lack of reproductive or fertility um, knowledge can definitely be a barrier to care. In some instances, even things like geography can present as a barrier. Um, and you know whether or not you're close or live in an area where the services you need are provided can be a significant issue as well. Um, other barriers are things like health literacy, language barriers, um, and certainly bias, uh, particularly provider bias about different groups of people, uh, how worthy these people are for treatment, uh, for care um, and whether the you know, perception of this group uh, warrants an evaluation. So these are all examples of barriers to care. You know, fertility and healthcare uh, have a long history and certainly learning from past examples can inform why things are the way they are now and how we can help change things for the future. You know, we cannot ignore the legacy of, um, of reproductive injustice, particularly against women of color, dating back to slavery when women were forced to um, have children and then actually separated from their children presents a, a really um, tumultuous history that has long lasting impacts today. Even, you know, issues of forced sterilization, of forced contraceptive use um, still have lingering effects in the healthcare system today and can affect trust between patients and providers. And so these are things that you know, providers should all be aware of um, to be at least knowledgeable of some, how some of these things impact their patients today. And so that we can you know, really turn the tide in terms of giving the proper attention and proper care to the populations that need it. I think what all women should know is that so far we have demonstrated that the COVID vaccine is safe to use for women who are seeking pregnancy, for women who are pregnant, and for women who are um, who have recently delivered or are breastfeeding. And so there's no reason uh, to delay vaccination or to push off vaccination. You know, one important thing that we also know is that pregnant women tend to get sicker with COVID-19 uh, COVID if they are infected during pregnancy. And the outcomes can be significant for both mother and infant. And so it's something that we uh, feel very strongly about is uh, recommending vaccination for all pregnant women, women who are trying to become pregnant or were recently pregnant or nursing.